Akhwal will talk about it a little bit in his talk. Um, let me give you the outline of the talk. Is the Dirac norm omega omega finite? How could it not be? Specifying an action and canonical commutators does not fix a Hilbert space. The Hilbert space is what the operators act on, and that doesn't you don't know that yet. We need to find a Hilbert space in which the Hamiltonian is self-adjoint. Setting Hij as Hji star only makes sense if H is self-adjoint when it acts on the Ij basis. Otherwise, you can't integrate by parts and throw away surface terms. So everything depends on boundary conditions. That's the key to understanding the Hilbert space. I'm going to present a procedure to determine whether or not omega omega is finite. And I'll show you that it's finite for a standard second order derivative bosonic field theory. And the method is to rewrite quantum field theory as a first quantized theory, as a derivative theory. I'll show that the same norm is not finite in a fourth order theory, and in that Hilbert space, the Dirac inner product, the Hamiltonian, is not self-adjoint. I will show you that there's another norm, which is the overlap of a ket with its CPT conjugate, as opposed to with its emission conjugate, and that is finite. And in that Hilbert space, this norm has no states of negative energy and no states of negative norm. I'll show you that this, uh, this is finite for a fermion theory, I'll discuss the issue from the perspective of path integrals. And somebody mentioned path integrals earlier this morning. The Wick rotation to the Euclidean case and show that in the fourth order theory, the contribution of the Wick rotation contour circle at infinity is not only not zero, it is even infinite. I'll show you how you understand what I'm doing from the perspective of Dyson Wick. And, and at the end, I'll discuss what it has to do with quantum gravity. Okay. There's a hidden assumption in quantum field theory. We take a, a neutral scalar field, very simple action, and a wave equation, a Hamiltonian, and a can canonical commutator. We introduce uh, uh, frequency modes, and we can write the um, expand the field in a, in a basis of A's and A daggers, and they obey the conventional delta three uh, commutator and we construct the Hamiltonian as A dagger A plus A A dagger. That's completely conventional. We then introduce a state omega that A annihilates, and we can identify it directly as the ground state of H. However, that does not specify the norm. We don't know that simply from knowing that A annihilates it. Now, let me see why that becomes a relevant question. For the same theory, you introduce a propagator with a delta function, you write it as a Fourier transform, and you'd like to identify it as the expectation value of the time order product in, the set, in that vacuum. You apply the differential operator to it, use the field commutators, and you find that it's not exactly equal to delta four, it's equal to the matrix element of omega in the vacuum times delta four. Therefore, you can only identify this quantity as the propagator if you've been able to show that the ground state matrix element is in fact finite. Now, the reason why this could even come up as a concern is the propagator that satisfies a differential equation is a C number. When you try to identify it as a matrix element of a quantum field, operator. You can't do that. You can't go from a C number to a Q number. You can go from a Q number to a C number. If you know this is the propagator, then of course, then you can establish that that's what it is. But you can't go that you can't construct a quantum Hilbert space by only knowing a, um, some, 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 some C number quantities. And so there's a jump in our, in our assumptions, in when we deal with quantum field theory, in assuming that we can construct the Hilbert space from the, from the structure of the propagator. And of course, that's the whole issue in higher derivative theories, such as using a pauli villars propagator. Precisely, you have the C number, and you make a guess as to the, to the Q number. And what Carl Bender and I have shown is that you've made, in using this form, you've made the wrong guess, 
because you hadn't checked the boundary conditions and they will show you that those boundary conditions are not finite and this norm is not finite either. So this is a hidden assumption. So now we have to ask, well, how on earth do we ever determine what is the norm of the vacuum? So to do that, I have to do, I have to go back to quantum mechanics and then generalize it to field theory. In quantum mechanics, life is very simple. The Hamiltonian is P squared plus Q squared. The commutator is QP is I. We set P as minus I D by DQ, solve the Schrodinger equation, and we get a ground state energy, which is a half and a wave function, E to the minus Q squared over two, which is nicely uh, well behaved. We go into occupation number space. We write Q is A plus A dagger, P is A dagger minus A. We find that A with A dagger is one, and we introduce the no particle state that A annihilates, and it also has energy a half, just as we would want it to have. However, that doesn't tell us what the norm of that state is. It doesn't oblige it even to be finite. To fix the norm, we need to relate the ground states, this one and this one, in the two bases. To do that, since A is Q plus IP over root two, we set Q A vacuum, which is Q plus D by DQ vacuum equals zero, and find that the overlap of Q with the vacuum is indeed E to the minus Q squared over two. We now calculate the norm. We, introduce, we put it in a complete set of position eigenstates. We've identified Q psi as psi zero, that's psi zero star. That's the integral DQ E to the minus Q squared, which is root pi. And we've established that the Dirac norm of the no particle state is finite. Finally, we can divide by pi to the quarter and we normalize it to one. Why were we able to do this? Because we know the form of the wave function. So what's the, what's the message here? The procedure is straightforward and familiar. It works because both the wave function basis and the occupation number basis have something in common. They are both based on an infinite number of degrees of freedom. So in the occupation number space, we can re represent creation annihilation operators as infinite dimensional matrices labeled by vacuum, A dagger vacuum, A dagger squared, and so on. For the wave function basis, we can use a continuous variable that varies between minus infinity and infinity. The two sets of bases are both infinite dimensional. One is discrete and the other is continuous. The advantage of the continuous basis is that it enables us to express the normalization of the vacuum as an integral right here with an infinite range. And then we can check, does the integral converge or does it not converge? And that way we can determine the normalization of the vacuum. Now, what about field theory? For field theory, we have an occupation number space, but we don't have a differential wave operator space. So can we write quantum field theory in, in wave operator basis? Well, yes, because we have the A's and the A daggers, we have the phi's and the phi dot is a delta function, but we can't realize this condition by setting phi dot is equal to minus I D by D phi. That just does not satisfy this relation at all. If we wanted to satisfy the relation, we'd have to identify it with a functional derivative with respect to phi. But let's see if we can work with ordinary derivatives. Now we can certainly express the Hamiltonian in terms of creation and annihilation operators. That's what we had um, right at the beginning. We already have the, the representation in terms of the A's and the A daggers. So now I'm going to try to go the opposite direction to what I did with the non-relativistic oscillator and introduce at each momentum state, a is Q plus IP, A dagger is Q minus IP, and the Hamiltonian becomes Q plus IP, Q minus IP. And now the QPK prop, uh, commutator is a delta function and each K. And so at each K, I can represent the P as a derivative operator. And then I have a Schrodinger theory for the Hamiltonian. This becomes a derivative operator. I calculate the overlap of QK, AK with the vacuum is Q plus D by DQ. And I identify in each QK state, the, um, the wave function is E to the minus Q squared. 
I calculate the matrix element of the, of the full vacuum. I have to multiply over the partial vacuums at each momentum state, put in the complete set of states as before, and I find that it is one. So what I've been able to do is I've been able to show that by converting the Hamiltonian back to a differential form, I can now check for the normalization of the vacuum. And you'll be delighted to learn that, of course, in ordinary quantum field theory for uh, second order field theory, uh, everything works. OK, let me just warn you, if you ever do the Dyson Wick expansion, you would identify this uh, matrix element as, as this particular combination. That's a standard expression. You divide out by this quantity, and then you get it into the standard perturbated wick form where you can make wick contractions and do perturbation theory. And if you just look at this equation here, you would say, oh, well, it doesn't matter whether the vacuum's normalized or not because it drops out of the ratio. Well, the point is it does matter because you could only have divided by this quantity, by that matrix element, if it were finite in the first place. So is it finite? Well, we just expand it out as a power series in HI, and the first term is just omega omega. So if that term is not finite, this quantity is not finite, and the Dyson Wick expansion doesn't work. And we'll see in a moment that that's exactly what happens in fourth order theories. Uh, finally, since I can expand phi in terms of Q's and Q, uh, A's and A daggers, I can write the, the whole field as a differential operator. I can take an interaction and I can set up the entire quantum field theory as a Schrodinger problem. Of course, it's not going to be a particularly easier one because interacting field theories have always been difficult. But this at least allows you in principle to write down quantum field theory as a differential theory. Now, fermions. Fermions, we have anti-commutators. We can represent the Bs and the B daggers. They obey the Pauli principle. B squared is zero, B dagger squared is zero. We can represent them by finite dimensional matrices. So for fermions, we have finite dimensional matrices and there's no issue with the normalization of the vacuum. The problem only appears for the, for the, for the scalar, for the bosonic theories, because we have to go to an infinite number of degrees of freedom. We, we, the A daggers keep on exp, uh, 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 creating states all the way up to infinity. So now we've seen one theory where, uh, where life is nice, and now we're going to do a theory where life is not so nice. This is a fourth order quantum field theory. It's got a, a mass term, a kinetic energy, and it's got an acceleration term. It has a propagator that obeys a fourth order equation, we can write the propagator in this very famous form where it has this famous minus sign. And so it has all kinds of problems. The theory was first studied in the, as a quantum mechanics by Pais and Uhlenbeck in 1950. And it gave the propagator, which is the same one as the pauli villas propagator. Only now, instead of Pauli and Villas having two, field the two fields, one normal and one with, with the, the negative metric, the Pais and Uhlenbeck obtained the full propagator from one fourth order theory. At large k squared, this quantity behaves like one of one over k to the four. So it makes Einstein gravity power counting renormalizable. Now you should notice that something special is happening here. In the standard perturbative approach to quantum Einstein gravity, the propagator is one over k squared plus one over k squared, not minus one over k squared. You never generate the minus sign in radiative corrections. And so Einstein gravity is never renormalizable on its own. This theory, as it stands, is renormalizable. We also note that all in the complex K0 plane, all the poles lie on the real axis. So whatever is the Hamiltonian that goes with this theory, its energy eigenvalues are all real. The standard I epsilon prescription that I use here causes positive energies to propagate forward in time and negative energies to propagate backward in time. So the energy spectrum is bounded from below. And with this I epsilon prescription, there is no Ostrogradsky type instability that would otherwise occur in a higher derivative theory. Some of the pole residues are negative. 
that's the unitarity violating negative norm ghost problem. If we insert some n1 n1 minus some n2 n2 equals i into this propagator, we obtain n1 phi omega squared minus n2 phi omega squared and generate the minus sign. And so it looks like the minus sign is coming from a closure relation with negative uh, indefinite metric. Is this too high a price to pay for renormalizability? This has been a, a major question. However, there is one more feature of this propagator, something completely and utterly innocuous. The residues are finite. Now, if the residues are finite and the vacuum is not normalizable, then this cannot be the representation of the propagator. And I'll show you immediately that the that this vacuum here, the standard one that we use, is not a vacuum which is finite. And therefore, the identification of D in this form is incorrect. And that does not describe this propagator. Something else will describe it. We'll have to replace the, the left side by the CPT conjugate of the right side. Then we will be able to generate the minus sign without ever having to worry about negative norm states. So this is the, this is the key feature, this uh, self-evident feature, the residues at the poles are finite. So I can work through, I, I can work through the theory, I can quantize it, the, the second order theory or the fourth order theory, I can quantize it, I can calculate the propagator, and I can show that it satisfies the differential equation only if vacuum vacuum is normalizable. So I need to know, is it normalizable? I have to find out. So what I do is I, first of all, write the field theory in terms of creation annihilation operators. It's a fourth order theory. So I have two sets of uh, creation annihilation operators, calculate the Hamiltonian, use the standard commutation relations. And I find a dagger A plus a a dagger minus a two dagger. So there's a plus and a minus sign. And that looks like I'm going to have trouble with negative energies. We'll see in a moment that that's not going to be the case because this second minus sign means that that minus sign and that minus sign um, compensate each other, which means the energy eigenspectrum is still uh, bounded from below, but we still have to worry about the negative sign in that commutator. So let me go down now to the quantum mechanics. So the trick we, we've seen, I first of all go into the quantum mechanics, I then rewrite the quantum field theory exactly the same way I wrote the quantum mechanics, and then I can check for the normalization of the vacuum. So Pysa Nulenbeck introduced the Pysa Nulenbeck operator, z squared, z dot squared, and z double dot squared, equation of motion, z triple dot plus omega one squared omega two, z double dot plus omega one omega two, z squared is zero. What is this? This is the original field theory one with the spatial dependence frozen out, and we'll see how to put the spatial dependence back in a moment. Now, this theory is very interesting. It contains a Z, a Z dot, and a Z double dot. That's too many for one oscillator, but not enough for two. So this system, despite its innocuous appearance, is a constrained system. So what we do is we introduce a new variable X equal to Z dot. We introduce a, con a canonical conjugate PX. We introduce Lagrange multipliers, use the method of Dirac constraints, and obtain the Hamiltonian. Px squared over 2 plus Pzx plus omega 1 squared plus omega 2 x squared minus omega 1 squared omega 2 z squared, where z and Pz are a canonical pair and x and Px are also a canonical pair. Finally, we take the usual differential representation of the Pz and the Px as differential operators, solve the Hamiltonian as an ordinary Schrodinger problem, and we find that this is the ground state wave function. It converges in X, but it diverges in Z. So this wave function is not normalizable. So from the beginning, we discover that the Pice uhlenbeck theory, where we work with the usual vacuum, um, which is the ground state of the Hamiltonian, the, eigen, the eigenfunctions are not normalizable. You could, by the way, construct a whole different set of wave functions which are normalizable, the, the plus sign becomes the minus sign. However, those states 
have energies that go down to, neg to negative infinity, and that's the Ostrogrodsky instability. So there are two sectors in the theory, one where the energies are not, where the wave functions are not uh, normalizable and the energies are bounded, and the other is the energy the wave functions are normalizable, but the energy is unbounded. And those are two separate Hilbert spaces. So what we have to do is we have to recast this Hamiltonian. We have to do a lot of work. It's all, I've, I've posted everything on the website if you want to go through the details. We have, <clears throat> we, we have the, the Zs and the Ps and the Xs and the Pxs. We write them as As and A daggers. We write the Hamiltonian as usual in terms of the As and A daggers. And we check immediately that the, ma the matrix element of the ground state put in the states ZX is indeed infinite. We, we knew that immediately. Um, this is the wave function. Um, the wave function is not normalizable. And now we go to construct the field theory vacuum matrix element. And we find that it is infinite because the wave function was not normalizable. So what we've concluded is that the fourth order theory Quantum mechanics is not a normalizable vacuum. So now let's go to uh, higher derivative field theories. Uh, basically, what happens is you work through exactly the same discussion as before, and we get the same Hamiltonian as we had a moment ago. The, um, we, we get the same Hamiltonian that we had a moment ago. That was for a single mode, and now we get the same Hamiltonian for a whole set of modes. There, there it is. And so what I've done is by introducing the Zs and the PZs, I've been able to convert the As and A daggers back into these differential operators at all momenta. So for every momentum state, I can construct an equivalent wave mechanics. Uh, you won't be surprised to learn. It must be the case that when I calculate, when I do this, I represent the commutators by the, the differential operators, work through the story, I'm going to find that the vacuum, the vacuum norm of the, of the the Dirac norm of the field theory is infinite. So the message is whatever is the normalization of the vacuum in the wave mechanical limit translates into the same normalization problem in the quantum field theory. So at this point, I hope I've dis I, I've persuaded you that um, that uh, the theory is not well defined. The fourth order theory is not well defined. When a quantum field theory is written in terms of creation annihilation operators, change the basis to position of momentum operators, realize the momentum operators differential operators, set up an analog Schrodinger equation, and then check to see whether the wave functions are normalizable or not. Now, what happens if the wave functions are not normalizable? Then you can't integrate by parts and throw away surface terms. That means the Hamiltonian is not Hermitian because it's not self-adjoint. Can we use the Dirac inner product? No. Vacuum at T, vacuum at T is vacuum at T equals zero, propagates with E to the plus IH dagger T, vacuum propagates as E to the minus IH T. If H is not equal to H dagger, that norm is not time independent. So we can't use the Dirac norm in a theory where the Hamiltonian is not Hermitian, and we can't use a, a, um, the Dirac norm in a theory where the wave functions are not normalizable, and therefore, the Dirac inner product is not the right one. Is there a better choice? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, there's a more general choice. We can look at the right eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and the left eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and calculate the left-right overlap. The left transforms as e to the plus iht, right as e to the minus iht, and that one is preserved. So the left-right overlap is necessarily time independent. You can also show that it's equal to the overlap of the right eigenstate with its CPT conjugate, because CPT is also, the T also is antilinear, just like conj Hermitian conjugation is antilinear. That's very nice, but is it is it finite and is it positive? So I have to tell you what to do. Uh, I won't go through all of the um, issues, but remember, we showed a moment ago that the matrix element of A2, A2 dagger in the vacuum was negative because the commutator was negative. But if that's negative, 
then A2, A2 dagger cannot be a, con a modular squared, which means that A2 dagger is not the Hermitian conjugate of A. This notation confuses you, but it's not the Hermitian conjugate, and therefore the A's and A daggers are not conjugates of each other, and therefore the Hamiltonian that's built out of them is not Hermitian. And so the suggestion that that number be negative only would apply if A2 dagger was the Hermitian conjugate of A2, but it isn't the case. And therefore, the, le the reasoning that causes you to think that we had negative norm states is simply not valid. That doesn't mean that we can solve the problem, but we've, we've diagnosed the problem. Uh, this was all worked out by um, myself and Carl Bender over the years, um, uh, using the PT theory that Carl had developed even earlier, starting as early as 1998, um, where he re replaces hermeticity by PT symmetry and more generally, I showed that you should replace it by CPT symmetry. Now, when you work through that, I'm not going to go through the details. Uh, it's all in the notes. Um, what you finish up with is you construct the right eigenstate and the left eigenstate. We have to do one thing. We have to make a similarity transformation of this form. And that sends um, IZ, Z, IZ to Y. Why do I want to replace Z by IZ? because the wave function was going like e to the plus c squared. And if I replace z by iz, it'll go like e to the minus c squared. So I'm making a continuation into the complex plane. And when I do that, I transform the z and its conjugate pz, but I don't, I don't transform the x because the e to the minus x squared was fine. And I finish up with this Hamiltonian with a minus iqx. Now you might say, ah, oh, well, if I've got a minus i, then I can't possibly have a real eigenspectrum, but I must have a real eigenspectrum because the poles of the propagator were all on the real axis and a similarity transformation can't change that. So how can they be real? The answer is the Hamiltonian has a PT symmetry and the PT symmetry re results in energies being, re uh, be being real. We calculate with this new Hamiltonian the wave functions, the right one and the left one. We calculate the overlap, and the overlap is finite. And that's the first step that we wanted to show. The final step is we need to show that we have uh, that everything is positive. And when you work through, we, we, we introduce an A2 hat which is a change because we remember we transformed into the complex plane. And when we do that, that I translates into this commutator being positive as well as that one. And so this is the Hilbert space. That's the completeness relation. And um, not this, not the one that we commonly write down. It's, it's right left, not, not state and emission conjugate. We take the matrix element with the omega left and allow me only to tell you, when you plug this relationship into that propagator, you develop the one over k squared minus m1 squared minus the one over k squared minus m2 squared. You get the minus sign coming from the fact that this, when you put in intermediate states, this is no longer a modular squared. And that's the thing that saves the theory. So we finish up with uh, a well-defined Hilbert space. Uh, probability is conserved. Matrix elements are finite, and there are no negative norm states, and so the theory is completely um, is completely uh, sensible. I can take that Hamiltonian and apply this similarity transformation um, over here, and I just becomes p squared plus q squared plus x squared plus y squared, which is clearly um, a positive, definite, and well behaved. To, to oscillators. In fact, this similarity transformation has diagonalized the Hamiltonian. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll have to leave out all of this, um, but it's, it's all in the notes. Now I want to say something about path integrals. If I write down the path integral from the th for the theory, I, I need to know, well, does it converge? Now this oscillates, so that's not enough. I have to put in m1 squared and m2 squared, replace them by minus i epsilon minus i epsilon. And what I finish up with is a plus m1 squared plus m2 squared epsilon phi squared, which means that the path integral does not converge. 
unless I continue phi into the complex plane and replace it by I phi. So from the path integral, immediately we see that the path integral does not converge if we work with real fields, but it does if we work with a purely imaginary field. And so this is basically a general statement. If you have a path into a, a Lorentzian path integral and it live and it exists with real fields, the underlying theory is Hermitian and the norm is the standard Dirac norm. If it doesn't exist with real fields, but you can continue into the complex plane to find in the complex plane that it does exist, then the Hamiltonian will still have the real eigenvalues as before, but now the norm will not be the, the Dirac norm, it will be the CPT theory norm. Okay. Now, what's very interesting about this theory is that when you go into the Euclidean time in time zone, what you find is that the Euclidean path integral exists. And yet I just showed you a moment ago with real fields, the Euclidean path integral exists, but the, uh, but the Lorentzian one did not. What that means in making the wick rotation, usually we replace the horizontal piece by the vertical piece, but now we see something new. The contribution on the circle is infinite. It can't be ignored because you finish up with a finite answer. Start, you start with an integral on the real axis, which is infinite, and a, an integral on the imaginary axis, which is finite, which means that the contour contribution can't be, can't be neglected. And therefore, this is a warning ab ab about Euclidean uh, path integral field theory. You simply have to be able to make the wick rotation and determine whether or not the, the Minkowski theory is sensible. Okay, now then, the very last remark. What does this mean for, um, for quantum gravity? The, let me take the standard Einstein theory and add on the Ricci scalar squared theory. I can work through the algebra. I find that the equation of motion is a G mu nu, which is the standard. I'm sorry, I need to remind you that you have five minutes. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, it's, the, it's the standard um, uh, Einstein tensor. The V mu nu is a higher derivative function of the Ricci scalar. We can expand around flat just to see what the first order perturbation looks like. We find that it, uh, that we take the trace to make like uh, to get rid of the indices. And we find that the trace obeys a one over k squared minus a one over k squared minus m squared, which we initially would look at and say, we have renormalizability, but we've sacrificed unitarity. But now we know that's not the correct procedure. We have to go into the complex plane. We can then re reconstruct a new vacuum, which uh, gives us a new inner product where the theory is well behaved. And then we can have this quantity be finite. Now, what this means is that you will see lots of discussion in the literature about saying, well, I can throw this term away when k squared is very small, and then I can treat the one over k squared as an effective theory. But that's not true, because even that one is telling you that you can't use the standard um, Dyson Wick expansion, which is what people use. You have to change the vacuum. You have to continue even the, even the piece that you like. You still have to continue that into the complex plane. OK, so um, the, the final comments, uh, I'll, I'll just state them. They're very straightforward. Um, for quantum field theory to be physically rele relevant, it must be formulatable in a Hilbert space with an inner product that is time independent, finite, and non-negative. However, in and of itself, specifying an action in a set of canonical commutators is not enough to either fix the Hilbert space or specify the appropriate inner product. Ordinarily, one supplements these re requirements with the additional, generally regarded as self-evident requirement, that the fields and the Hamiltonian of the theory be Hermitian and that the inner product be the standard presumed finite Dirac uh, n n1. However, this is not automatic for any theory and you have to check on a case-by-case -case basis. We've presented a procedure for doing so. The procedure is based on the occupation number space representation to construct an equivalent wave mechanics from which we can check for the normalizability of the vacuum and accordingly of the states that can be excited out of, out of it. An alternative but equivalent approach is to check whether or not the Minkowski time path integral with a real measure exists. If it does not, 
then the standard in a product is not finite and it's not the right one for the theory. I've used the occupation number space to find a, a case, a second order, plus fourth order scalar theory in which the standard inner product actually is not finite. In this example, the Minkowski time path integral with the real measure diverges, even though the Euclidean time path integral does not. Even though contributions from the Wick contour are usually ignored, in this case, they cannot be. Thus, the use of Euclidean time path integral can be misleading. And even if the Euclidean time path integral is well behaved, it only gives a good description of the theory if the Minkowski time path integral is well behaved too. Since vacuum vacuum is not finite, use of the standard Feynman rules is not valid, with these rules not only leading to states with negative norm, they lead to states with infinite negative norm. This lack of finiteness means the Hamiltonian is not adjoint, self adjoint when acting on those particular states. However, the Hamiltonian of the second order plus fourth order scalar theory is PT symmetric, so we can use the techniques of PT symmetry and continue the fields in the Hamiltonian into the complex plane. Then there's a domain in the complex plane in which one can define an appropriate time independent positive and finite inner product, viz. the overlap, right left overlap of left and right eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, with the resulting vacuum state being normalizable, with there being no states with negative or infinite norm. In this complex domain, it is the Euclidean time path integral that diverges, while the Minkowski time path integral does not. So again, there are contributions from the Wick contour. Finally, in this complex domain, the second order plus fourth order scalar field theory is fully consistent, unitary, and renormalizable, with this analysis being relevant for the construction of a consistent quantum theory of gravity. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very, very nice talk. Let us see, speaker. Okay, so, okay, Alexander, please go ahead. Zaharov. You have to unmute. May I ask? Yes. Something? Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, your consideration, is it some way related to the Hag theorem? Or is it different? No, not really. The Hogg theorem, as I understand it, is you make a what you think is a unitary transformation from one Hilbert space to the other, but then you discover that 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 it's not a valid transformation. I'm not making I'm not I'm not using the wrong Hilbert space. I think what you're asking me is if I were to work in the Dirac Hilbert space and I tried to get from that one to the PT. Uh, Hilbert space, Hogg's theorem was telling me I couldn't do it. 